Good morning. We have been talking through the season of Lent about God's covenant with us. Uh, you might remember that when Lent began back in February, we started with the covenant that God made with Noah following the great flood. We talked about the covenant that God made with Abraham and Sarah to Moses and the people of Israel. And then last week to God's love for the whole world exp expressed through the gift of Jesus Christ. Our text from Jeremiah is a different kind of covenant. Jeremiah tells the people that this is a new covenant. This covenant describes the relationship between God and God's people, but instead of this covenant being spread across the sky as a rainbow or being written on tablets of stone, this covenant is written on our hearts. Let me give you a little history of Jeremiah and put him in context with some of the other biblical characters whose stories we've been hearing. Jeremiah, along with Isaiah, is one of the major prophets of the Hebrew Bible, what Christians commonly call the Old Testament. Jeremiah's a major prophet because we have a lot of writing from him and narrative about him. The book of Jeremiah is 58 chapters long, and it includes poetry and sermons and story. Jeremiah lived after Moses, after Moses had led the Hebrews to the Promised Land, and King David had created the state of Israel and established Jerusalem as its capital. Following the reign of David and his son Solomon, Israel was divided into two kingdoms, Israel in the north and Judah in the south. Jeremiah was from the north, and he was worried. He was worried for very good reason. First of all, one result of the people being settled was that they had been paying less and less attention to God. They'd been paying less and less attention to the covenants and the commandments that God had made with them when they were in the wilderness with Moses. They no longer had to rely on God to give them their bread, their manna every day. They no longer looked up at the sky to see the pillar of cloud or the pillar of fire leading them forward. This is not so different from the way many of us lead our lives. We go through the motions of religion when we're expected to do so, and the rest of the time we go about our own business. The other reason that Jeremiah was worried was political. There were big, powerful kingdoms to the north of Israel. Assyria had just fallen to the Babylonians, and things were pretty upset, up, unsettled up there. Word was it, Word had it that the Babylonian army was merciless and they were looking to expand their territory and the countries of Israel to the south were looking pretty good. Do you hear any contemporary resonances here about religious extremists? The world has not changed that much since Jeremiah was prophesying in 609 BCE. People have not changed that much either. Jeremiah's message was for the people to turn away from their sin and disobedience and turn toward God. This didn't exactly win him popularity contests. He was thrown into a pit at one point in his ministry. This was by his own people, not by the Babylonians. Many leaders, he, unfortunately, his predictions came true. In 587 BCE, the capital of Jerusalem was overrun by the Babylonians. Many of the leaders were taken into exile in Babylon. Jeremiah chose to stay with the exile, with the people who were left in the ruined city of Jerusalem. Jeremiah is most often portrayed as an old man with a long white beard, weeping over the destruction of Jerusalem. And if you want some truly chilling reading, I would point you to the book of Lamentations. It's only five chapters long. It comes immediately after Jeremiah, and it talks about the state of those people who were left in Jerusalem with no food and with a shattered infrastructure. 
I imagine there are people in our world today, in Syria and in Nigeria, who are trying to live in similar conditions. And the thing that is amazing to me about Lamentations is that in chapter 3, verses 23 and 24, we have this extraordinary statement, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O Lord. It's where we get the text of our hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. The covenant which Jeremiah talks about in chapter 31 is evidence of the faithfulness and radical love of God. The same love which prompted God to send Jesus Christ to the world. This is a new covenant, not a more forceful set of laws carved on something even bigger and more permanent than stone tablets. What's new about this covenant is that it is written on our hearts. We are called to know the Lord not because someone tells us we have to, but because the knowledge of the Lord is already written on our hearts. It is part of who we are. And I think this has huge implications for who God is and who God created us to be. We are God's beloved. We are God's children, and God is our Father. We can ignore that reality or deny it or pretend that it doesn't matter, but that does not change the truth of it. Being God's children doesn't keep us from sinning or make us better than other people, but it means that our identity as God's chosen, as God's beloved, is deeper than anything that we can do to obscure or deny that identity. Jeremiah tells us that when we claim that when we remember that new covenant with God that God has written on our hearts, God will forgive us and remember our sin no more. I want to tell you a story about some people who heard that covenant from God, heard that call in their lives, and acted in such a way that they shared that love with other people. Some of these people you might know. Some of them you've probably never heard of and will never see. But maybe you have been part of this line of people who has shared God's faithfulness. There was a man who went to a seminar at Northwestern University about the effectiveness of camps and conferences for young people. He went to two conferences for the Christian Workers Society of Ohio and Indiana and Michigan. He was so impressed with the results of those conferences that he went and asked if there could be a group formed to see about having a camp. His name was L. W. Schultz, Lawrence W. Schultz, and he, along with Russell Wenger and Moyne Landis, and, Russell and Sadie Wampler were part of a locating committee. They visited more than 12 sites on lakes in northern Indiana, and then they decided to wait for a few weeks to make their decision because they didn't want to go into a hasty decision. While they were waiting during that time, they got a letter from a brethren farmer named Jacob B. Neff, he had some farmland along the shore of Lake Wabi near Milford, and he wondered if they'd be interested in coming to see it. They were. They did. They went and saw that land, and that land became Camp Mac in 1925. Many of you have stories about Camp Mac. Uh, Lynn Bollinger could tell you stories about L.W. Schultz and he helped to build that stone chapel at Camp Mac that's called the Schultz Memorial Chapel. My daughter's going to be married there this year. 
So many of you have those stories. Some of you went to camp as campers, never knowing that you would meet people that you'd be sitting in a Sunday school class with someday. Some of you have served on committees and campaigns and participated and provided leadership for Labor Day Family Camp. You never know the ways that God's faithfulness is going to work through people that have a vision to start something and continue it. It's God's faithfulness that continues that ministry through camp ministry today. A lot of things have changed in the last 90 years at Camp Mac. Uh, not everything has changed. When I was doing research and reading the story of Camp Alexander Mac, which was written by L.W. Schultz in 1956, there's a line that says, a favorite food item at Camp Mac is cinnamon toast. <laughs> so not everything has changed. But I think there are ministries that are going on there that the founders could not have imagined. This July, 19 through 25, Camp New Happenings will be at Camp Mac. Camp New Happenings is going to be the special offering project for all of the camps at Camp Mac this summer. Uh, let me tell you a little bit from their website. It says, Camp New Happenings is a camp for preteen children who have a parent in prison. It's a chance for kids to be together with other kids like them and have a great time. Camp New Happenings is a chance for children of the incarcerated to, to thrive and survive spiritually. And I was struck by that phrase, survive and thrive, because the faithfulness of God is more than just helping us to survive. It's a way for us to thrive and to grow and to share that love with others. That is the ministry of Camp Mac. That is the ministry that we are all called to through this new covenant of God. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. God's mercies never come to an end. They are 